welcome back to the podcast. I'm here with my very special guest, Perth Toll. Perth is the founder of Life and Liberty Indexes, an index company that uses human and economic freedom metrics as the primary factor in its investment process. Prior to Life and Liberty Indexes, Perth was an advisor at Fidelity Investments in California and Texas. Hi, Perth. How are you doing? I'm good. How are you? Thanks for having me. I'm great. It's my pleasure to have you here. Uh, I'm, I'm so excited to learn more about Life and Liberty Indexes and your mission with the FRDM index, which we can say. <laughs> so just tell me from the beginning kind of how you ended up creating this company and this index and what your mission is. Yeah, sure. So we started this company so that people who have an interest in freedom and also believe in the benefits of freedom as a foundation for economic growth and societal growth over time can have a way to invest according to those values. Um, so currently in or before we created this index in emerging markets index investing, um, most indexes are, you know, were and still are market capitalization weighted, which means you get for example, in MSCI indexes, which the iShares products are based on, like EM and IEMG, um, those have between 36 and 38% in China, direct allocation. Um, and then in FTSE, or the VWO, which is based on the FTSE um, Emerging Markets Index, that's by Vanguard, um, that product has 41% in China. So 41% in any one country, regardless of the country, is not very diversified, and there's a lot of concentration risk there. Um, but I grew up in both China and the U.S., and so um, I had a taste of living in both a very free and a very unfree, uh, relatively speaking, market. And when I went back uh, after college, um, I lived in Hong Kong for a while, and when I was in Hong Kong, I traveled to the mainland China and to Shanghai, to Beijing and so forth. And I saw the difference that freedom made, not only in my life, but also in the markets in these places. And so that was where the seed for the idea came into to place. Um, I didn't know at that time that it would manifest as an ETF one day. Um, I came back to the US, I worked at Fidelity for 10 years as a financial advisor. Um, I had a lot of clients also that came from, because I was in, in the LA area and also here in the Houston area, a lot of clients were non-native um, to the States and they came from oppressive governments and op oppressive countries. And they said, you know, the same thing that I had expressed, which is I don't want to invest in the stocks in my home country because I don't want to be supporting um, those types of regimes. And so, um, so this is created so that people who want to have an emerging markets allocation can do so and have a broad um, allocation to emerging markets um, and have that exposure without the exposure to the worst human rights offenders like China, Russia, Egypt, Saudi Arabia, and so forth. I love that you're just <laughs> calling it like it is. And to, to make that statement a little more clear, it's not, it's not your opinion. It's actually based on uh, quantifiable data, which this is what's so great about it. Explain kind of how, how the ratings work, where they come from. Yeah, so we use data from the from three think, tank, think tanks, the, the Cato Institute, the Fraser Institute, and the Friedrich Nauman Foundation um, for Freedom. So these three think tanks have a joint project called the Human Freedom Index and Data Set, and they have a quantifiable um, data set using 76 different metrics of human and economic freedoms. And I break down um, those metrics into three categories, the rights to life, the rights to liberty, and the rights to property. So rights to life are things like terrorism, trafficking, internal organized conflict, if there's a lot of wars going on in a country and so forth, um, tr you know, torture, disappearances, um, things like that. And we've seen a lot of disappearances going on right now with the coronavirus situation in China and so forth. Um, rights to liberty are things like your, your uh, kind of political freedoms, like freedom of speech, freedom of the media freedom of expression, freedom of religion, freedom of assembly, and so forth. And then property rights are your economic freedom. So things like taxation, rule of law, private property rights, um, soundness of monetary policy, um, freedom to trade internationally and, and have international bank accounts and so forth. So all of those freedoms work together. And, you know, freedoms are kind of like 
uh, my favorite quote about it was from Jim Gortney. It's, it's, it's like the parts of an automobile. So you can have, if you have a steering wheel without a transmission, the car is not going to run. So that's why I like these, um, these think tanks because they use both human freedom and economic freedom metrics uh, because I believe those have to work together. Um, economic freedom being a prerequisite, uh, being, being, a, being a necessary prerequisite, but not a guarantee for human freedom. So these guys quantify 76 metrics into one country score and I, per country, and I use that country score to turn them into country weights and inclusions. Is anyone else doing anything like this? Uh, no, not that I know of. So we, we, I do know some people that um, incorporate some economic freedom factors into their overall strategy. Some um, uh, SMAs that do that, and uh, I've seen, I've talked with some managers who incorporate um, some of these, some of these freedom factors. But nobody is a freedom weighted index, so we are the only one at this point. What a powerful way to brand yourself. <laughs> We're for freedom <laughs> globally. Uh, I think that's fantastic. It seems like this is something that anybody can really understand, whether you know people listen to this podcast, some of them have a rich finance background and understand all of this. And some people are in marketing and advertising. Some people are in voice technology. We have kind of different groups that, that probably will be listening to this. And I think it's something everybody can you know, bite on. Like, yeah, I, I hope so. It does resonate with a, with a lot of people and um, I'm really thankful for that. Yeah, it, it's pretty simple, right? It's, if a country is repressive, it's more likely they will have economic problems in a weaker market. You know, you mentioned Jim Gordon's analogy with the automobile. So what does it look like if a country has one of, like, let's say they have uh, liberty, but they don't have the other two tenets. Yeah, so I mean the big elephant in the room is always China, right? So they're always exhibit A for any kind of example you want to have. And they've made a lot of progress over the last 30 years as far as their economic freedoms, right? So they have kind of a partially capitalist society, um, but they still have the full um, control of the, the state, which is, you know, the, right now the communist, Chinese Communist Party. Um, so it's a very interesting dichotomy and you know while they've opened up a lot on economic freedoms they've really cracked down on the other end which is the human freedoms and everybody expected that when china opened up their economic freedoms that human freedoms would follow but that's just not what happened and in fact now we see it going backwards so especially you know now we see with everything with coronavirus all the cover up that went on in the beginning um, the disappearances and the arrest of doctors whistleblowers um, the closing down of labs that were investigating it and, and the kicking out of journal, American journalists. Um, it just goes on and on, you know, uh, interference in, in governmental, you know, world organizations like the WHO. Um, so there's a lot of, um, I guess, disappointment in the way that China hasn't opened up as far as our human freedoms while they have this economic freedom um, side making a lot of progress and i think what i realized when i was back there um, in hong kong is there was a lot of excitement when i was there and this was a long time ago like 12 years ago um, about the opening up of the china business and um, i realized that despite all of that excitement and all of that opening up um, if they didn't match that economic freedom progress um, was the same thing on the human freedom side, that eventually it would reach a plateau because people are the driving force behind any economy and any society. And so if your people are not free um, to innovate, to be creative and to not live in fear um, of censorship, arrest, disappearances or worse um, for expressing their opinions, then you're gonna be, you know, not having as much innovation and creativity as you potentially could. And China is a prime example of, I think, have a country that has so much potential. If they would just let their people be free, I think that it's, it's limitless over there. Wow. Yeah, yeah I, I agree with you on that. Um, what would it take for them to let their people be free? 
I mean, it doesn't take much. <laughs> they could just do it. <laughs> so um, I think the problem is that a lot of people in power um, feel like they have to hold on to that power um, at all costs. And it, it sometimes feels like, I don't know, I, this is a, you know, I've never used this example before, but uh, I don't know if you saw The Lion King um, when it came out. So I have a, I have a oh, kid, the so newer thought, version? Yeah. yeah. I did. The I saw Lion it. Lion King. Um, yeah. It's like, you know, they, I think when I was watching that, I, I almost drew an analogy to China. It's like, you don't, you can't, they feel like you can't just change um, the system. You have to actually, you, it, once you change the system that you, you will be like eaten or uh, ex, ex, exiled or worse, you know, like there has to be an overthrow. And I think that's what people, that people in power are scared of right now. That instability and in that possible, I guess, you know, overthrow of a government because that's what they don't want. But I think it doesn't have to be that way. You know, you can have freedom. Like they don't like democracy. Okay, I get that. You can have freedom technically without a democracy. You can be a benevolent dictatorship, right? So, <laughs> I mean, technically speaking, it's, it's very unlikely because, you know, power tends to lead to control and corruption and things like that. Um, but the people in power could just decide to let their people be more free. They could just do it. And so I don't know why they don't. I think it would be great for the economy. Um, a couple of, a couple of um, leaders ago, progress was being made in that direction. And I think that peaked out around 2011. But, um, but yeah, currently it doesn't look like it's going that way. Hmm. And it's always going one direction or the other. And that's the thing with emerging markets investing, you're never neutral. You're always supporting either a freer regime or a an unfree regime because there's such discrepancies between these freedom levels between the countries and the same thing with a country itself is never going um, in a neutral direction it's always going one way or the other so you're either going toward freedom or away from it and so you know it's never just staying on the fence and there's just so many things happening now in china that leads us to believe um, that direction is not is not toward freedom currently yeah there's something really poetic about the way you just described that. Like you're either marching toward freedom or away from it. You're not sideways, slowly approaching it. It's yes <laughs> or no. Yeah. And so, I mean, and people say black and white thinking is not a good thing on some measures, but with this, like, it makes sense to me. How many countries are there that you are looking? Was it 26? Yeah, there's 26 emerging markets countries in our initial universe. And then we take only the ones that are big enough and tradable enough to go into an ETF. It has to have certain, um, you know, tradability to be scalable. Um, and then out of those, we take, you know, we do the country scoring. So the country scores from the think tanks um, are put into our algorithm, which then derives the country weights and inclusions. Gotcha. So we end up with that we ended up with 10 countries. We don't cap it at 10, but the last couple of years, the index has been live. It's always had 10 countries. But, but sometimes it can have nine, it can have 11. It's just always been 10. And then we have 10 securities per country. So there's 100 securities, which is why we call it the Freedom 100 Emerging Markets Index. Gotcha. Yeah. <laughs> and so can any individual investor invest in the FRDM index? Yes, they can. So anyone okay. can invest in this like any other stock, you know, in, wherever they trade stocks. Robinhood, so can, Fidelity, yeah. Schwab. Yeah. Just go to your brokerage and look for that symbol. And then you can. Yeah, well, yeah. Uh, it's, yeah. We can't that's how simple. Symbol on here. Yeah. <laughs> we, we, won't, we won't mention the symbol. But it's but easy to look up. <laughs> yeah. Um, well, I'll be, I'll be investing for sure. Oh, thank you. I, I I'm optimistic. That. You're welcome. And I believe in you. It. I love what you're doing. You and I connected I, sometime in the last year or two through Josh Brown, who has been a big supporter of what you're doing. The whole team yeah. at Red Bull, it's Michael Batnick. Those um, guys are great. And I have Michael Batnick's book in my pile now for my, um, it's right here, Big Mistakes. Yeah. So last time <laughs> I've read it. In there, I want to make sure you note that he's in there now. Uh, also a note, if you're going to invest, and I know that, uh, you know, you're just saying that, but, but you're, I mean, I, I know you're going to invest, but you're also not making a recommendation to that's buy correct. or sell securities here. Um, that that's, is correct. That's just the, the statement there. And I'll check with your financial advisor, check with uh, Michael Batnick <laughs> and Josh Brown and uh, just make sure it's appropriate. Um, but yeah, so those guys, you know, 
how I met them is actually was through Barry. Uh, Barry and I were at the same fishing camp at Camp Kotok um, uh, before before I met Josh and Michael. And one day he, I was in New York and Barry was like, well, why don't you come meet Josh or come meet Josh? Because I had talked to him before about um, how great Josh was. And he was like, come meet him. We're having, you know, this uh, conference. Maybe Josh wants to come and have you speak. So come meet him. So right before I was heading to the airport, I was in New York. Um, I went to their office. This is before their new office. Um, it was back like uh, by the MetLife building somewhere. Um, so I went there. I had just been beaten up in all my meetings for like two days. I didn't care. I just went in there. I was like, man. I was like, is there a bathroom? Like, is there, you know, is there a bathroom? <laughs> like, I was just like, it was so, I was so dejected. And then yeah. I went in there and I met uh, Josh and Michael. And they immediately resonated with the idea. And they were like, hey, can we be on your board? And I was like, yes, I don't have a board. <laughs> we'll make one. So because of them, we have a, an advisory board. And it's just people that kind of you know, support me and help me with planning or you know, big decisions and things like that. Um, and it's just completely just you know, kind of a, an advisory thing. It's not, like a, it's not like a fun board or anything like that. Um, it sounds like a fun board to be on. Yeah, <laughs> no, a fund board. Is not oh, a fund, fund board. <laughs> That's much more serious. Yeah. Gotcha. Um, gotcha. Yeah, but, but this is a fun board. Um, it's and, fun. And, yeah, and those guys, those are they're great, and they've just been so supportive. Uh, I just have so much respect for the way that they are always connecting people, the way that they're so real and they run their business, um, and the way that they you know connect communities and. Um, and how they just interact with people. So I so appreciate them and, and their involvement in this. I'm very proud to have them on the board. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I agree with everything you said. Um, so thanks to Josh and Barry and everyone at Ritholtz for ultimately leading me to meet Perth and enable us to have this conversation and talk more about freedom and let more people know about freedom. And you know, as Perth said, of course, this is not a recommendation or financial advice. And you should consult your financial advisor if you are considering any investment. Um, but that said, I think the fact that you're doing something no one else is doing, and it's positive, it makes the world a better place. It's good for people. It's good for countries, economies, therefore good for business. Uh, what's not to like? <laughs> like so, so you mentioned going on, I think you were on Josh's, it was on YouTube, it was on the Compound YouTube channel. Is yeah. that the one that's the day when you were dejected? Because I watched that video, it seemed fine to me. No, that's not the day. Oh, it was that, a different the one. day that I, I went in there completely dejected was like two years before that. Okay. Yeah, that was before we, you know, had any, before they were even in that office. They were in a different, completely different office. Okay. Yeah. So, so you have definitely, you've been on Daniel Crosby's podcast, you've been on Josh's YouTube channel and multiple podcasts. And it, I noticed like you're in the media, you're promoting this, you're talking about it, letting people know about it, which is great. Is that all that it's taken for you? And is that because what you're doing is something people, people will hear about and say, I like that. It makes sense to me. I want to talk about it and tell people about it. Um, in your business, is it, is it something where normally you'd have to spend more ad dollars or find find buzz another way like I guess in a way that's not earned what you're doing is earned media yeah so I have been um, just so grateful to people that have lent me their platforms so I think that yes the idea did resonate with people um, and some of those people have huge platforms that they've allowed me to use and I'm so grateful for that you know Josh and Michael are one of them um, Eric Balchunas uh, at Bloomberg is one of them. And he had me on ETF IQ before I had an ETF. I mean, I don't know if you know, anyone else has done that. And so I, I just so appreciate that. And of course he had me on after the launch, but when it was just an index, you know, he had me on the show. Um, ETF.com wrote about it. Laura Kruger wrote about it before we had an ETF. I mean, when it was just an index. And so I think um, the way that, that people resonate with this shows me that the idea is is not this is not about me it's bigger than me and yes I'm out there promoting it all the time and I actually should do more uh, and that's yes that's basically all the the marketing that we have um, at some point maybe you know when it gets bigger we'll have more budget for, for other marketing um, but right now this is pretty much all we can do um, and it's it's worked great um, 
I think uh, in the beginning, uh, a new fund is typically starts out small and with organic marketing is probably the best way to go just because the people that are gonna write about it or talk about it are the people that have resonated with it. So you get the best kind of um, like best promotion from that. Right, right. I totally agree. <laughs> you know, it's, you know, you're onto something good when you're able to garner that type of organic promotion or a platform. Um, there are so many people who are trying to hawk something that's not beneficial or likable and they're just kind of shoving themselves in front of people like, look at me, look at me, I'm running down the street. I want the audience <laughs> eyes on me, but are, is what you're saying worthwhile or helpful? If it is, then you'll end up getting attention naturally. So. Yeah, I, I'm appreciative of everybody who has given us their platform for that. Yeah, it's hard as a new ETF, uh, you know? It's, uh, you're coming up against some big giants, um, very established names in the industry. You know, doing this type of waiting, especially is, is brand new. So it takes some getting used to. And I, I, hope, uh, I hope we get bigger um, as time goes on. And, um, and I think we will. Um, but uh, in the beginning, it's very difficult. So I've been very appreciative of anyone who's shared their platform with us, yourself included. <laughs> oh, you're very welcome. I think at, at the core, let me make sure I understand this. You believe there's a better way to invest in global country markets and that way is overweighting companies who promote freedom for their citizens um, and then underweighting the countries that are repressive or the bad actors um, the ones that have corruption and human rights issues yeah uh, yes <laughs> you got it <laughs> like this is, it's so positive and i wanted to i wanted to do this today um because i think everybody needs optimism and a little uplifting message and with everything going on with um, the economy right now. Yeah. Like, it's just a reminder that there are people out there that are doing good and shining the light on progress, which is what you're doing, right? We're trying to, yes. Yeah, you're, <laughs> rewarding, you. you're rewarding positive progress and yes. human rights and freedom. Freedom, yes. jeez. That's the idea. Oh, yeah. Fantastic. Um, so Thank Perth, you. Uh, this is a kind of fun question that I like to ask everyone at the end. Um, is there a podcast or a book that you've read or listened to recently that, that you would recommend? Yeah, so I have a big stack of books behind me, and one of them is called Red Notice. It's this red one right here. Um, it's by Bill Browder, and I, I recommend him for anyone who's interested in um, just a good story, but also emerging markets investing and uh, especially investing in unfree countries. He is an ex-hedge fund manager in Russia um, when they just first started privatizing everything and they didn't really know how to do it right. And so there were a lot of arbitrage opportunities and he took advantage of that and made a killing. And he made so much money over there that this, the Russian state actually figured out a way to steal the taxes that he was paying. So just his taxes alone were worth enough to come up with a scheme to kind of steal from the people and, and give that money to the oligarchs. And so they uncovered this scheme and you know, his lawyer, Mag Sergei Magnitsky, uncovered this scheme. And as a result, um, he was kicked out of Russia. His offices were ransacked. His lawyer was arrested, tortured, and eventually died in prison. Um, and as a result of that, uh, Bill Browder gave up the hedge fund business and now is a full-time activist. <laughs> so um, that is the story of what happened. Red Notice uh, by Bill Browder is the most riveting like finance book I've ever read. Um, and I, I've given this to my board members too. So Michael and Josh both read it and have you know commented on it. It's it's awesome. Everyone on the fun has, board. <laughs> yeah. He also, Bill Browder also has done a podcast with uh, Preet Bharara. And so, and that pod won several awards. I think it was like two years or one year ago. So you can look that up as well. A recent one that I heard um, that was really good about investing in crises was um, uh, Dan Rasmussen on Invest Like the Best. So um, that's a podcast that most of us on Fintuit are very familiar with um, by um, O'Shaughnessy, not Jim. Patrick. Yes. <laughs> Okay. Sorry. Mommy yeah. brain. Um, yeah. So Patrick O'Shaughnessy, of course, um, 
Invest Like the Best with Dan Rasmussen. That was a really good one about investing in crises. It's a little more wonky. So that's a little more for like if you're a finance nerd. Um, Bill Browder is for anyone. Great. Well, we'll have all of <laughs> Perth's finance book, podcast recommendations, and every link that we've mentioned here on the show at beetlemoment.com slash podcast. This is episode 68 with Perth Toll. And Perth, let people know where they can follow and connect with you online. Yeah, so I'm on Twitter at Perth underscore Toll, and I'm on LinkedIn. Our website for Life and Liberty Indexes is lifeandlibertyindexes.com. Fantastic. Thank you so much, Perth. Thank you for having me.